Welcome back to the Optimum Drive podcast presented by TFL. Uh, in this podcast, we're going to continue my conversation I had with the great driver and great friend Tanner Faust, and we're catching up with him basically on everything Tanner has done and sort of led him to the point of where he has this incredible career as a professional driver that's done just about everything from Formula Drift to hopping in Formula One cars to racing in Extreme E currently. So let's jump back in and uh, figure out where this Tanner Faust story goes. So we're so okay. we're doing perfect days. We're drifting M5s. Um, your what do, what do you do in motorsports wise at that at that point? You're just starting to get into drifting. Take yeah, I just started getting into drifting, still rallying. I think I got a production GT championship in 2005. And then 2006 is when um, the X Games included rally for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started my relationship with Rockstar, which lasted 18 years. And that was, uh, I raced on the Subaru team. Um, my teammates were Travis Pastrana, Ken Block, and Colin McRae. And Colin McRae was one of the, yeah, it was like a, it was like a jump. I mean, I knew Travis, who he was. I, I didn't really know Ken that well. He was more, at that point, he had just sold DC shoes and he was thinking about getting into car stuff. So he, he wasn't, you know, who we all know him um, to be now, but the, uh, but Colin was certainly larger than life for all of us. Nobody could believe Amazing. he was coming to the state. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he'd only been to the States one time before 1985 for some race, but it, he, you know, it was legendary that he was showing up. I got to ride around with him in, uh, at I'm the test that. days. Yeah. Oh, and I learned so much in 2.2 miles. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And he loved talking, driving and talking, give me tips and this and that. And, and he, he kept a blog on, on his, uh, on his website at that time just to date how long ago this was and he he mentioned our time hanging out in the blog which was a big highlight for me at that time to get a mention from colin but um i took him drifting actually i was doing a show with uh um hulk hogan i think when they were shooting that reality show and i took a car to give his son who wanted to get nick hogan who wanted to get in drifting i took my car over there to give him some tips and i took colin with me and he drove, he drifted Irwindale and uh, met, oh, actually, he asked me, what do I call him? Do I call him Terry or Mr. Hogan or Hulk? I, you know, I don't know what to call him. I, I thought that was funny. I never thought about that. But yeah, yeah. good question. I usually don't even say, anything. talk to him. But um, yeah, so, but X Games started a role of rock star relationship. Um, Rockstar was a rapidly growing company and they, um, had no motorsports, anything. And, uh, so they, they stuck with me though for 18 years, even though all they wanted to do was get a Lamborghini with a big rock star on the side. And I'd say, Hey guys, I got this new sport rally cross. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. They'd be like, okay, cool. We're down. What do, do you drive like a, what a Lamborghini or is it a Porsche? I was like, no, it's a Ford Fiesta, but um, to trust me, it's going to be real fast. And they were like, hated it, but they did it. And then it's like, Hey guys, I'm switching teams. And I'm like, sweet Lamborghini. Nope. We're going to be driving a beetle. For <laughs> and they were just like, I got great news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Iconic car from the sixties. Oh, Lamborghini Ferrari. Yeah. No people. Yeah. <laughs> they were a great partner because they were so, so small. There were only six employees at Rockstar when when I started with them, and then uh, they sold fifteen years later for four billion dollars. Wow! And uh, it it was really fascinating to watch the company go through that whole process. But for us, they uh, you know my value for them was was connecting them with manufacturers. I believe. Um, they they got more play with you know marketing campaigns from Ford and marketing campaigns from Volkswagen who spent big money that Rockstar never spent um, that it that it covered anything that we could spend racing wise. Yeah. Um, so that that turned out to be a good relationship for a long time. But but yeah, 2006 that was that's when that started. Right, right. And so you did all of the, I mean, rally cross through all the X Games. I remember coming to that like. 
the LA Coliseum stuff. And then, you know, and then it ends up uh, downtown LA. Uh, I'm doing commentating, sometimes coming around and helping you out here and there, corner spotting for you or whatever it is, or just chatting. And um, I think it goes to Austin, to Texas. I remember uh, all that too. They had the X Games there. I was yep. just in, I just came back from a few days ago and I'm always in that stadium section. I was showing, I'm like, this is where X Games was back in the day. Sort of when uh, when Coda was was brand new as a as a track. Yes. Um, so yeah, and, and yeah. of course you end up with with um, man oh man, just that's when things. I mean, you really hit your stride. I think when it came to just the obviously you had great success in drifting, and you kind of continued to drift more in like a one off thing. But it was rallycross that I don't know was was do you do you say you're were more passionate about rallycross or it's just where the money was. What do you what do you say about uh, like sort of that era of your life? It wasn't. I didn't think it was going to be where the money was necessarily. It's just that drifting, drifting. I I became professional drifting. Yeah. Like with drifting, uh, I could I could get money to do stuff with cars. Got money to drive. Um, if you opened up any of those kind of lifestyle magazines, the, um, sport compact car, or any of that stuff, our car was always in one of the ads, you know, our partner, you learn to network a bit in drifting and really kind of, um, but, but learn more, I think about sponsorship because, uh, drifting was a lifestyle sport mm -hmm. to big companies like Ford and, and Toyota, um, and so you got their marketing budget to tap into, not their motorsport budget. And so the motorsport budget, of course, is, you know, is just a drop in the bucket to the marketing budget. And so we, we had so much more, you know, we could influence a brand by lowering its mean demographic age. We could make the average buyer younger. We could do big things about changing the image of the brand, not just saying they like to do cool stuff in racing. And um, so that that's that's what I learned from drifting, but I didn't like the judged factor. I, I didn't like that there wasn't a clock. I didn't like that you you sometimes felt like you did it right, but you didn't get the result out of it. And with rally cross, at least you had a clock. I I know now that all motorsport is judged on some level, but um, there's uh at least you had a clock to go against and you got instant gratification if you were doing something right and in instant learning if you were doing something wrong right and so um i saw a video of marcus grunholm doing a, a rallycross race in sweden it looked like the freaking most fun thing ever in a car at that time uh for branding sake i really tried to have a story to tell for sponsors. I was with Ford at that time. I just left Toyota. And the story that I found, and it's the way I drop, drew passion out of my own, uh, I, I, the way that I came up with, the, um, kept interest in something really, was to sort of have a mantra or, or you know, something to stick to. Because, you know, it'd been a lot of years of doing, of doing the same industry. But um, for me, it was keep driving fun, right? So that, that's what I was into. I was anything fun driving. Top Gear came out. Top Gear was a show that just showcased the fun factor of motorsport. Drifting was fun. Uh, Rallycross, I thought, was the most fun thing you could do with a car. I mean, you jumped, you yeah. slid, you had drag racing, you pushed other cars. You wheel to wheel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it was like a video game and very much like, you know, those video games that were coming out at the time dirt two and dirt three stuff like that it was like a video game for real and so i just love talking about the fun that attached to ford they loved the fact that the fiesta was seen as this fun thing and they had to sell two million of them so they um bought into it and then we did the u.s championship and the european championship simultaneously and it was a busy busy decade really yeah yeah it was an uh, amazing racing and you know, rally cross, like you said, it was just sort of like everything you wanted um, in in a, in a sport where it was just this intense wheel to wheel uh, fender to fender racing where you're leaning on each other. Short heats, easy to understand. Um, lots of big names in there with with Travis and Ken and um, Deegan and 
all those guys that were in that series you had the Europeans with Marcus coming over. Um, yeah, it was, it, it, that was an amazing time for sure. And, and such a great championship. Um, and, and meantime, meanwhile, like you mentioned top gear, obviously we did that together. Um, in a, in a, even though, you know, we didn't really get to talk about that. And it's always my experiences with, with top gear and, and getting to be the stig and, you know, start with that ridiculous tryout you you put me through uh, at El Toro, <laughs> where <laughs> I had no idea what was going on, <laughs> and, uh, and it was you know you had this little one hour slot where I show up and you know you're like a really good friend, but when I met you there you like didn't act like a friend. You're like get in the car, we got to do this. I can't show any favoritism, and you give me this ridiculous lap in a Mazda Speed Three. I think completely sideways. You're just slinging the thing around on this course that I, I it was going by so quickly and I'm trying to like understand what's happening and sort of catch up with you and then we get back to the start line and you're go you go get in that Mustang and do a lap and I'm like I what <laughs> like I don't even know, <laughs> I don't even know where the first turn goes you know and uh you're like well everyone's got to do the same thing you got to get in and do a lap and so I, yeah. I get I jump in that Mustang and do a lap and I get a little lost and come back and you're kind of like shaking your head like you're like oh, that wasn't very good and um and then somehow i get in the aston martin next and somehow i do a clean lap in the aston martin that lands me the job <laughs> and um that was kind of crazy i always wanted to hear your perspective on all that because that's my perspective it was like i had an hour and i got to do two laps in a car after a crazy ride around with you and then I get a call back two weeks later saying I got the gig, which was amazing. My perspective, I think you all you had you always had it from the beginning. But ah, that's yeah. a bit of a revelation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think you always had it. I think for them, they were thinking money, so they were thinking, look, whoever it is, they need to fit in your driving suit because they were thinking that I was going to do half the stig stuff, right? because I was there anyway, and then they would have to pay flights and pay somebody else to show up. Um, it quickly became evident that that was not physically possible um, since, you know, for a lot of reasons. But the, uh, so that was one thing, and uh, which we fit in the same driving suit. And then uh, they, I think they had the tryout as a matter of, insurance or safety or whatever for me i think you had it from the beginning so it would have been so, nice if you had said that. <laughs> i didn't think you, was, you know this was 2007 ish it must have been so he's telling me that now it's just really <laughs> never said that he's never you said know that. i felt like i still had a debt you didn't fire me after i got super drunk at tokyo dells dancing on the table <laughs> So I was like, yeah, I mean, this is all just a, he must assume he's got the gig, right? No. No. Apparently not. Apparently yeah. not. No. Yeah. Well, well I, good. I was told there were like a bunch of people that came and did this tryout and they all had, you know, this one hour slot. And there so, were. Yeah. Yeah. There were. I, I don't remember a single one, to be honest. I can't remember a single <laughs> one. <laughs> I, that's another thing I always wanted to ask you. Maybe like maybe like Ryan Center would know or something like who he, who the other guys were because that that's something I get asked all the time and I'm like I don't I know bet, I was there for an hour so I don't I didn't I meet. bet Center would he probably brought a couple guys of his own that work that he'd worked with Nah he hadn't done he had done some car shows um I mean for sure you know ACP would have wanted it but he, we we were not anywhere close to fitting in the same driving suit um I yeah i can't think of a single <laughs> my story got so much sorry to just a... <laughs> <laughs> thanks tanner i mean uh let's see Isn't no that you, the joke we used to tell the time, they were stuff. so far your lap times were in another world compared to all those other guys i mean we just had and and they had to go back to their imsa rides and their yeah exactly you know their all right there we go. There. Yeah, I, I, had, I had to fish and beg for a little bit, but you came through in the end. <laughs> hey, I do remember. So it was. So there are a couple of things that are, and you can add all you want about any of this. But here's like my 
my recollection was like, you know, I'm off by myself all the time dealing with coked up David Hasselhoff or whatever it happens to be, or driving yeah. some car and and I'm in a minivan in the corner of the some track somewhere. And you're literally the only guy I can talk to because you're the only guy that knew who I was. And so yes. it was like, like my, it was like lunchtime, finally broke for lunch. And I would get to talk to my first human being that day. And it would be you showing up and you're like, how's it going? And I'm like, uh, I bought a couple of movies off Amazon. I've been doing push-ups and sit-ups all day. Um, that's yeah, that's it. right. Am I going to? I mean, to they had you staying at a, they had you staying at a different hotel. Different hotel. You had assume name. You sat in a rental car off in the distance. There with the air yeah. conditioning running. You had to put the helmet on anytime somebody came close, or you had a trailer or something. Yeah. I mean, they took it really seriously, and the other two hosts, Adam and Rutledge, were so pissed. They just thought they were being treated like three-year-olds that they couldn't. Oh, like we can't keep a secret. Oh, my God. They won't even tell us. Blah, blah, blah. And then so finally, to make them happy, they're like, okay. Hessling, John Hessling was like, look, it's not a big deal. We believe you can keep a secret. He, I'm not going to copy his British accent, but he was all in a British accent. And he'd say, oh, yeah, if you you can meet the stig. We're going to have a formal meeting with the stig and everything. And they'd be like, you know what? That's fine. Nope. No, thank you. We don't even want to know now. That was it. They were so like bitter. literally like four so years. Ago. Yeah, it was hilarious, and and I think they realized that it made it more fun. It did. Fact, yeah, yeah, that it that they didn't know because it was genuine. They would shake your hand. They would try to get you to say something. Yeah, yeah. And then they would talk about how I think he's got an accent. I think I, I think I could. Well, tell I did. Him. You know, I used that bad Italian accent I stole from Valentino Rossi trying to speak English. Oh my so gosh. That's like, Ah, uh, the car it it uh, not to handle so well. Maybe um, too much understeer. Wow! Please never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing that to like John Hennessy, like anyone that would show up who I knew. Yeah, I broke out that awesome accent. Wow! I know that's I know. funny. It's you know, I was I was like under pressure, and I had to come up with something in the moment. I'm like, yeah, I, I, and you, I was just afraid that if I just used my voice, that he'd be like. Oh, like that. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that yeah. first year, you had a lot of pressure because that first season where we had the big star small car thing, yeah. you'd have to coach them all up, and and we did a full season of that stuff. Later, we just you just have to come in to race the cars every so yeah. often. You yeah. didn't have to interact with somebody, you know. But yeah. it's um good times for sure. And I remember. Okay, so here's here's like the best Tanner Paul ver version of, or or maybe our rivalry or whatever. But the one time I didn't wear the suit because I did end up doing all the stick stuff. Tanner shows up in his rallycross car, and I'm not sure whether it was his idea or the sponsor's idea. Like, he's driving the car for the lap. And yes. The, and the, and, the, and the and so I have to sit there in my minivan. Let's imagine I'm like a naked mole rat because you took my suit. So I'm over there in <laughs> I'm over there in the van while you do a lap. Yeah. Wearing my suit. And yes. damn it, you break the track record in your rally cross car. <laughs> oh, I wasn't mad. <laughs> I wasn't mad. I did not realize the bitterness what year did you oh, say that yeah. was 2000 because 2008? who's whose damn track was that tanner who laid it out who put in all the work who whose track was it sure okay <laughs> you came up with the track i just broke the record that's it's not that big a deal let's let it go <laughs> <laughs> no it was so, a uh i want to that that was an andreas thing you know because it was andreas erickson's car that's a good answer and he he was lending it for free. Mm. So his thing was that, yeah, that I'd have to drive it. Yeah. Sorry. I wanted you to drive it. I wanted you to feel that thing launch. It was a ridiculous car. It was terrible but, on the road course. And the, and the best part it's, about this story, of course, is someone about a year or a season or two later shows up in a turbocharged aerial atom. And I'm like, this is my shot to get my track record back. <laughs> I had no idea that this whole little vengeance bubbling. thing was cooking. Bubbling. Oh, for the Brewing. <laughs> Boiling. <laughs> yeah. Did you break it? I did. Okay. 
I did, and you that knew about it because you were mad. I remember at the moment <laughs> you were like, "I saw that thing launch, and I knew it was done." It was I yeah. Think, well, well, it weighed nothing. It weighed like fourteen hundred pounds. Yeah. I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. Like I should have broke it by a lot more. I know what you're implying right now, but I got it. <laughs> it was, it was good. I like the. I like the. I mean, it, it was a busy time. Top Gear was a busy time because it was 150 days of filming, plus racing a full championship in Europe and a full championship here. Plus, I just had a daughter. So there was it was a busy, busy time. But so you and I didn't really talk much out of Top Gear. We talk on the phone every so often. But then the only time I you just sometimes and I didn't really know sometimes what we were shooting that day or what cars we were yeah. going to be picking or whatever. Yeah. And I'd show up and I'd see the van. I'd be like, Oh, Stig's here. And then I, I wouldn't even know you were going to be there sometimes. And so I yeah. cruise out there. So it was always nice, but, um, the, uh, but yeah, that was, that was, we had a lot of fun on those shoots for sure. sure did. I'd like, we should, we should do one with all of us together. And they, I would love to hear how bitter they are. Cause I bet it comes <laughs> so you need to you need to promise me we'll all four of us do do a podcast together i don't care if it's mine let's do one okay we i'm just, down we can just pull the band-aid off really quick we talked happens. about we talked about getting the band back together for at least like a lemons race or something like yeah. that we did a lemons race together i'm the only one that drove the car though because i blew it up <laughs> you want to hear the, the backstory on that one yeah 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 I had already booked a flight on Sunday and we were supposed not to sound like a high maintenance bitch, but <laughs> we were supposed to shoot it Saturday and then be done. And they sort of changed the plan. And, and me flying back wasn't to go to a spa day or something. It was to go to a, a sponsor event or something that was on the calendar that I couldn't move. Um, <clears throat> and they showed up with the car and they're like, yeah, we're going to shoot this on Saturday and we're going to shoot this on Sunday. And, um, I think I did a stint in the car for filming and then they said, okay, now, you know, Stig's going to do his deal. And he's like, how long is he in the car? And they're like, oh, he's going to do a full tank of gas. I was like, we're good. That's fine. <laughs> that thing's never going to make it past freaking 40 minutes. It was, it was less than that. Yeah. Sure enough. I mean, you came through there just, just shattering the thing to pieces i think it had like a lemon stand maybe that was off by then or not <laughs> it was know. gone yeah either way you were hauling ass i saw a couple times you come by and i was just like and and they're like yeah tanner we really have a problem with this flight it's like yeah we don't let's just see what happens <laughs> let's just see what happens you know what and i like went right back from being you know high maintenance needed to get out of there and just to realizing that it was all just going to work out. And sure enough, you blew the shit out of that thing. <laughs> Destroy, just grenade at the engine. <laughs> and then the funny and part was. Rutledge both, yeah. Go, go ahead. What was well, they both looked at me. They knew because I told them. It's like, this thing's never making it to your stand. Trust <laughs> me. And they both looked at me. They're like, oh, my God. That was pretty funny. I, they tried to talk to me like I blew the engine up like through turn one and I pulled it off driver's left turn two at Sonoma at Sears Point and the corner workers of course come up and they they want to talk to me and I'm like I can't talk to anybody so I just I just walked away <laughs> I just, like I just left the car and I just walked back to the garage and then and then just uh, lo they lowered the garage door and I they were like we need to talk to him they're like no you don't get to talk to him <laughs> you don't get to we'll send in this consigliere yeah, exactly. Done. <laughs> it's all done. That was that was really, really, really funny. And yeah, just grenaded that thing. And oh my God. And there's yeah. so many different things that we did, you know, driving, you know, I remember driving trucks and vans and jumping stuff and oh yeah. Just so By the way, they they to this day, the producers think that I made a deal with you to blow that car up <laughs> because of that travel. Day. still to this day they're convinced no they just you're talks. like i know he's a full throttle nitwit he doesn't understand yeah. to not race the car and he's going to try like to keep everyone could. he has yeah but, hey, basically, but i mean they, they think that's what the stig would do they think about it like days of thunder or something where you just over rev it till it blows the engine which i mean the crown big's not going to let you do that but 
that's that's what they're thinking that i like said hey blow it up blow it up yeah blow yeah up. exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i just like put it in neutral and revved it to the moon somewhere and blew it up yeah that was fun i remember it had no power at all so i couldn't pass anyone down the straightaway so i was just passing everyone on the outside the inside <laughs> everywhere yeah it was, that was it's good funny work. i was i was thinking about top gear today what an amazing group of people we worked with though because it was and for that time it was the most I, time i spent with anybody was with the top gear people's on and and there were only a few people that made it through all six seasons and they were a complete family i mean we it was really weird when it ended to to just stop seeing everybody we did a couple reunion dinners here and there you weren't invited because nobody knew you but it was uh <laughs> we did a couple of these things and it was, you see uh, how i was treated <laughs> yeah. i'm just finding out things today it's so funny <laughs> you did show up to one thing you showed up to x games one time but it was actually one of the producers wearing the suit that's that was the genius of yeah i didn't suit. even know about that yeah yep yep yeah. um but yeah it was uh it was a special group that and it was a it, it was a there's so many it was really amazing that that show worked in the u.s for so long it was in 90 plus countries or markets so over 100 countries and um did 72 episodes some like 700 or 750 days of filming and wow. uh yeah, yeah it run. was it was a long long run for us i think and you also did um the the supercars exposed beforehand right or before yeah i had done tv for like five years or so before that but it was all like speed channel you had the paul tracy one, like, one yep yeah there were supercars exposed and then that was by myself and then there was battle of the supercars which was with tracy before that was import tuners i think there was that's uh there was red um oh god i can't remember the names of them, but that's where i met ryan center oh cool yeah yep and um who was one of the pr first producers on on top gear but it was uh all those shows were really fun they all started out of drifting doing interviews for one of the drift producers um for they it was g4 tv which was like a video game network. i remember that yeah yeah, do you, yeah. Know, do you know who our pit reporter was tell me i have told you before but it was olivia munn oh wow yep. yeah and uh, on great things went on a great things and then we uh they were like, hey, we got this show and you seem to do good interviews. Would you like to maybe be a driver host of the show? And I was like, sure. And it was called, it was on Mag Rack TV, which was free in hotel rooms. It was right next to the porn. So <laughs> it would be like, you can either watch a Corvette do donuts in, you know, a church parking lot or, you know, Lawrence of Arabia. But it was, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know how big you are. <laughs> but Great. it was the, same. <laughs> <laughs> the costumes were very similar actually very similar strange. yeah yeah which is strange well sand in um, places yeah yes but um it was that this so the tv thing did run for a while top gear i think was so busy that i really wasn't looking forward to doing another show right after top gear and i haven't really done much tv since then yeah other i got than stunt stuff yeah yeah. yeah just on stuff and things like that yeah hey and so and so during top year because we're we're, get, we're getting there we're making progress i don't know if it feels like we that. are that's good because i'm oh, yeah six percent yeah good. good plug that thing in will you um, it's plugged in i don't know what's up <laughs> so so the what the other thing that we did i had two secret identities at the same time and we were both i was the backup but we were both yellow drivers for a hot wheel stunt that was occurring while we did top gear and that kind of, we kind of did that for what was it like six months or so we did um yes we did, we did the uh the world record jump for hot wheels that ended up with you in the car just how many how many uh views does that video have now on youtube it's like 80 right. 90 million 100 million it's crazy there are probably four or five videos over 50 million from yeah. that it's but incredible. i know it did two billion impressions in the first year the next stunt did two billion in two weeks back when they used to use impressions as you know the the matrix but it's um 
that that was so another parallel in our lives uh your wife's tupperware friend's husband became became uh became my manager brian gale is that how the connection was Am no i mean the, the tupperware part threw me off but basically um we, we we all grew up together like brian and i went to high school together oh that's right in Virginia, so, and, right? and so yeah so i've i've known brian he showed up and i showed up senior year at this baptist school where karen my wife uh was going to school and so that's how and he dated my wife first and it's just normal high school stuff <laughs> i know it sounds a little funny but but then he met his wife mindy after karen and i were dating and i asked actually asked him for permission to date karen I'm like, is it okay? Because he was off of college in West Virginia. And I'm like, can I, yeah, you, you don't really like her anymore, right? Well, <laughs> I've I seen this like movie her. so many times. Yeah. 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 And somehow we're still Her, friends. And, turns out yeah, it wasn't we were, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It, and it, it wasn't Lawrence. So anyway. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So that was, he was a manager. He had, he had talked to Hot Wheels. They'd come up with this thing. They were like, hey, they want to do a loop and a jump. And then they narrowed it down to a jump. And then it was like, I, you know, my my business model at that time was just say yes to everything, throw all 10 balls in the air and then see which ones yeah. come back, um, which in motorsport is very common. But the, um, you know, the drawings were ridiculous. The scale was ridiculous. Uh, the concept was epic. The whole like toys for real. I'm literally looking right now because I have boxes to unpack of a box of the remote control version of the hot wheels truck have you seen that i never got truck. one of those Tanner. i just got, i just had the match okay. box <laughs> no no this is like a little remote control truck but anyway the um it's probably got a wire it's fine you don't want it anyway but uh it's I'm coming to your house and steal uh, it. <laughs> it eventually kept moving forward to the point where it actually happened and, and i wasn't sure like if the engineering was going to be good you never know because i never worked with any of them right so i was like um you know i had a couple of requirements and one of those was that i needed there needed to be another driver that went through all the training did all the the jumps and was ready to go if i got sick or if it turned out that I, it was just i didn't think it was going to work out <laughs> sorry paul but exactly the, uh, <laughs> <chose me. laughs> his expendable friend it's that he's like turned i can finally I a, get rid of that debt if i get rid of him <laughs> yes and it turned out i had a crush on karen and the only yeah, way that the it was things i'm work finding out, out. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so uh it was um yeah so we did the stuff i just wanted somebody i think i didn't i didn't have any intention of backing out but i wanted to be with somebody who wasn't just an off-road racer guy who was gonna just say wing it it's going to work out fine i wanted somebody to be there who's going to be analytical about it and possibly miss some of the data points that you know pick up some of the data points that i may have missed and so that's why i wanted you there because i knew you would analyze it from a scientific perspective and that would give us the best chance of actually making it happen safely um it's turned and i think that's how it happened it did we I came mean, up we, with we the, talked a lot about that damn truck like oh yeah and the ramp right. and oh my god yeah it was it was we incredible if you this, haven't seen this, that video go watch it it's it's an incredible jump and um it was you know it's a world record and the thing that i think we both realized as we were progressing we started in el toro which is yeah where the top gear track also was um, in Southern California, and we started, actually, we started in the dirt, the desert, and then we moved El Toro to the real ramp, but, but it was all for us, just like we learned as we went, and yeah, there was engineering and projected speeds, and it, the engineering turned out to be pretty sound, it just turned out that the truck was a bit of a problem, um, and the space that we were going to do it in in Indy really wasn't enough, so it made the ramp too steep to get the distance that we needed, which tended to break the truck a lot, and um you know and it was just all these things that compounded from that and I, I made that point very early on when you and i just started talking on this podcast where where you started talking about the sky swing and all of that where i kind of it kind of clicked in me that that you you kind of been through this process a little bit before with bill 
And, um, and I hadn't, I hadn't ever approached something like a world record, whether it's a truck or anything else in jumping distance. And for me, it was just like, man, there is a lot of unknown in all of this. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and you were just, you were amazing. And I, I just, and I, I had a huge amount of respect that I, I already had had for you and all the things that we had done together all the way up through Top Gear. But watching you and your grace under pressure, I, I still remember like they winched us up 100 feet uh, on this thing backwards. And I remember Tanner texting on his phone while he was hanging from the cable. And uh, they'd be like, and he'd be on his phone just, you know, because again, like you, like you were saying, it was a very, very busy time. So you had 10 irons and 10 fires and eight of them were going at any given moment. And, and uh, so you were constantly communicating, trying to get this shoot set up or whatever it happened to be. And, um, and so you would like, they'd go, okay, Tanner, fire the truck. And you'd be on your phone and you'd be like, okay. And you would just like tuck your phone away wherever you were putting it in your suit. So it wouldn't fly out during the jump. Right. <laughs> and, um, and you were like, suddenly you were 100% present. Like it was amazing for, I don't know if I ever talked to you about this, but specifically, so specifically, but just to watch you go into game, you know, Pfizer down mode, full focus, full concentration, and you would just nail the jump every damn time. And then the jump was over and the phone would come out again and you were just off in the, and, and we, and like I said, we, but there were moments where we had to do debriefs and you were hundred percent present there, but that was one of the things to me, like it cemented, you know, when I used to tell people Tanner earned his spot in motorsports, uh, in this, in the stunt world, he's, he has not been gifted any of this. Like he did it on ability. That was one of those cornerstone moments or foundational moments where I, I realized sort of what you brought to the game and why people trusted you to do crazy things like break, break world records in trucks. It was cool. I appreciate to watch. that. It was cool to watch yeah, be a part of. And you were, you were so far beyond me in that. You were so far beyond me. Like, I think as far as like, you know, us bantering back and forth and developing the truck, I was there, but. I, I couldn't that that thing I mean to put it, put it bluntly that that stunt scared me um, and and so I always thought about like that truck breaking on the damn ramp like it did and like the one time where it broke the motor mount with me and they made that whole video out of it and they made up what happened but basically I lifted out of the throttle because I felt the motor mount like the, the transmission smash into the whatever yeah. it hit and made a hellacious noise. And I got out of the throttle on the ramp, which you can never do. <laughs> you can't do because the minimum speed is the minimum speed. And I went off the ramp, you know, below it and barely made the 275 gap, barely made it and landed on the nose. And there's a great video on YouTube of that where the truck's white. That's me. Oh, uh, and, and the way it arced off the side of the ramp and the suspension just absorbed it. Yeah. And I was, wa I was watching it and I was like, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, OK, good. He's good. And then. There's a camera guy. No, no, no. And yeah. Drift right by him. It's a, like, it's oh, a cool it's video. <laughs> the camera guy stayed with the camera, got yeah. the shot. He and um, I had a big hug afterwards. And I went, why'd you stay? And he was like, because it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the camera guy. Now you're doing like, that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, that was the best. As the thing went off the side of the ramp, it didn't drive off the ramp, it went off the side of the ramp. And I, I thought it was going to, I was telling one, I thought it was going to roll three times and it never did. It was a big drop and it big just dropped. Cat walked its way right off that thing. Yeah. It and I an went full throttle. So it yeah. didn't roll. I just lit it up. <laughs> I just light it up. <laughs> that was a big It was, one. yeah. There's, you know, there's something about, you talk about a zone. There's something about it. <clears throat> maybe our brains are lazy in that sometimes some people I think need to be in you have a lot at stake in order to focus that's me you know sure. are you late to the airport because you need the anxiety to build up so much before you leave that it forces you to get out the door or i don't know there's a lot of different analogies but flying is like that for me you know flying i i i, I love the fact that uh like the, you know a four-hour flight when i fly myself doesn't seem that long because you've got to be paying attention and heads up there's a lot at stake yeah um uh stunts and things like that you know there's there's it, it you know may call it maybe passiveness or, or laziness i don't know but you're forced to be in the zone 
because of what's at stake. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it sure would be nice to have the mental discipline and maybe it's developed over the years, um, but to, you know, just make yourself uh, motivated to do anything that you don't want to do. Yeah. But um, I'm not like that. Like I said, the room behind me is a gym. I've seen it twice. I've been here for three months. Then the uh, so yeah. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. it's not quite that bad. But it's there is something about having everything at stake it's that the best. Um, it's the best and the worst at the same time. And but it makes you the happiest when it's when 100%. it's done. Yeah. Um. You, 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 yeah. You have something we're, to say. We're, we're going to kind of talk about this more and more as we talk about driving, like part two. But you're you're nudging into the subject matter. Um, and it, it's absolutely right on point. Like that's exactly what it's all about. And and I, I want to kind of really talk about that. Um, but let's let's keep going a little bit. So we did the jump. You broke the world record. Um, we did it in a crazy space where we shouldn't have been able to do it. There wasn't the run up that was needed. There wasn't the flat ramp that the guys in the desert that do these world record jumps usually do. And um, it was kind of insane engineering and and. Um, very much at the limit of what could be done. And that that makes me all that much prouder of what what you did that day at Indy with thank God that 13 mile an hour tailwind <laughs> that, that really made the difference. Cause I heard that truck misfiring when it came down and I knew it wasn't running on all yeah, that's what it, A lot of people don't realize that it, it went, the truck got loaded up onto the door, hundred foot door. Yeah. And it was on Saturday right saturday and and on sunday it was 20 degrees warmer it was a carbureted truck they couldn't rejet it without we weren't able to test it so they said okay you'll be down 190 horsepower but it should still get to the speed right should and it, it didn't get and to the speed barely when it had all the horsepower it, like, i know it barely made it get a little adjustment digits. on the lip and that was it yeah it had to be triple digits to clear the gap and um the gap was 220 feet and then the world record was 300 feet which we had broken i don't know how many five or ten times yeah, in practice times, yeah. but um yeah then that that and so i left the ramp with a bit too much throttle the goal was 60 percent, remember and i left with 88 five percent which stuck the nose in the air so i went to the brakes and had to go completely to the brakes to pitch the nose down and that stalled the engine which was a side rotation so now it started this side angle which in the truck didn't feel like anything but then it just kind of kept going over Compound four seconds yeah 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 and it just kept going and going until i don't know if you ever saw slow motion videos and stuff but the wheels went straight into the wood ramp the tires just flexed out of the way and the wheels would go straight into the ramp and um the suspension was incredible at that point right i mean it just soaked up the landing no yeah. matter how crooked it was you snapped a rib i think on yeah, one I of did. those sides yeah um but i had a rib protector in so thank you and uh yeah that's what i'm there yeah. for buddy. <laughs> yeah and it ended up working out yeah but it was yeah. uh it, it had all the i mean it was scary because they had rent, you know, on the Indy 500 weekend, they did it at the gentlemen start your engines. All the drivers were allowed with the team owners to come over in golf carts and watch. They, awesome. they drove right up the brick across the brickyard to come watch. Um, 250 rooms or something rented out in right in the circle in Indianapolis for Mattel. So you couldn't just be like, mm, it's too windy. You know, we're not going to yeah, do no, it. It was happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's at the point where everybody you realize during all the testing where 12 miles an hour seems oh that's in the range barely maybe one mile an hour we probably would call off the practice for today right, but that's when you realize all that was fluff on the event day you're gonna you the know investment they had made evil you're gonna evil can evil that thing regardless that's just <laughs> or I you know was, what you said no you know, or somebody was going to somebody yeah. was going yeah <laughs> but. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It, with all that power, I I didn't know I, that you could hear it missing. I it heard just... it missing, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" And and but then I watched it go off the ramp, and again, it carried, and it was the tailwind because El Toro always had a cross headwind. Yes, so we had always jumped it with a cross headwind, and we'd sort of come up with our 
with our distances and speeds based on always having that wind. And I remember people saying, at Indy, we'll have a tailwind. And we we're like, okay, that's awesome. How did they know that? That's incredible. Well, just because it was the prevailing wind that time of year, that morning, that's what you'd normally get. So odds are we'd have a tailwind. And, and of course, you jump further that day with a misfiring engine than we had ever jumped with a healthy engine at El Toro. Yep. Yeah, we'd beaten our own record by like a good amount. Ways. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was amazing. And again, just a, a moment where I got to see got to see you and work with you. And, and, you know, thanks again so much for having me on that. It was so much fun to be a part of, besides the fact that it kind of scared the hell out of me. But it was good. I mean, like I said, I learned a lot from, from all of that. And, and now I, I remember I did like a, you know, we started jumping, I think it was like in spring. And so that winter I was in the terrain park skiing, doing the biggest gap jumps just getting used to just doing big jumps, you know, because I wasn't ever really like a big jumper. But I was like, let's see if I can go 100 feet on skis, which I did like a lot, you know, to get comfortable. And, uh, and that that actually kind of helped. But that was that was a hell of an experience. It was a hell of an experience. That was a, that was a very unique, big, big stunt. I just don't know. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that that was a great experience. It really and was. then you did the double the double loop with uh, Greg Tracy. Yes, that one was different in that you couldn't start small and get bigger, like we could with the jump. Uh, we got a remote control car guy to outfit a Mitsubishi. We were driving Mitsubishi Evos, by the way, since you yeah. mentioned pre Evo or post Evo, yeah. which we did buy Evos from the same dealer about the same, same dealer. Time. I got number one, you got number two. <laughs> yep. And uh, my Evo had made through its life, it went in on to be a race car, a drift car, a camera car, and then one of the Hot Wheels loop cars. Which is amazing. It's amazing. Um, but they, they got the one car, they hooked up remote control, like controls to it to get a guy to go through because they said 52 and a half miles an hour. Greg and I said, bullshit. That just doesn't sound right. Can we just see it once? They're like, yeah, sure. No problem. So this thing goes up, falls out of the sky, <laughs> tires bouncing everywhere, just blows the doors off of it from six stories upside down, basically dropped on its roof. Right. And um, so then they're like, Oh, well, we're going to get a net. So they got this net they put on the top of the ramp. They, they, they put a, uh, uh, something heavy up there. I don't even think it was a car. It was just something heavy. They let it go. It bounced once. All the hooks went punk, 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 punk off the net, and then everything <laughs> did crash. You know? So Greg and I are just like, oh Jesus! And so exactly. I had one of those little Traxxas RC cars. That was the first thing to go through the loop, and it would do sixty. And I swear, we watched that go through the loop, and then everybody, all the marketing people, and everybody looked and be like, okay. Who's first? You know, and that was, it was like, well, we never did prove anything, but Greg's first. <laughs> and, yeah. Rock, paper, we, scissors? We did. We did a rock, paper, scissors. And he, I, I forget who won a loss, but it was if you did the first loop, you got to go, you got to win the race on the day because it was two cars that went okay. into one lane. Anyway, long story short, we did it three times. Something broke about the car every single time. And uh, including my front suspension one time, which got my head. It's 6.8 G. I was gonna, just going to say. It was 6.8. We ended up in airplanes, got G tested and everything. Um, 6.8 Gs. And then uh, at one point, my bumper hit the front, which put me against my Han straps. And I couldn't pick my head up and I, I, until I got to the top. And so I had to do like the little turn while I was oh looking God. at my lap. While upside down. <laughs> It was it, upside down. It was horrible. We put paint on the top so that when you were upside down, you could take the hand lock off the throttle. Um, that was there in case your foot, you know, slipped off the pedal. And then you could slow down a bit so you didn't get another 6.8 Gs at the bottom. Anyway, we broke it every time. So we're like, let's just pack it up. We'll just do it on the day. It makes it. We just, you know, just break don't keep breaking stuff. Yeah. And, um, and we did it. And we broke stuff and it, we had never even tested the jump on uh, not a single time. We were just like, well, whatever. If we get through the loop, the jump's no problem. <laughs> well, and we'll cross that bridge if it were there. <laughs> Greg, he shoots his damper and his spring goes shooting off. I right remember that. Yeah. My intake hose had come off, so I had no boost. 
So I was full throttle coming down the loop and it was like, brr, making, making like, 100 horsepower, maybe. Or barely cleared the ramp. I think I left rubber on the leading edge of the landing ramp. Oh, but um, yeah, we did it and it was done. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I was racing that weekend also with, uh, you know, in the rallycross event. So That's that was right. kind of my yeah. focus. But it was, uh, it was like a box checked and it was, um, that one was scary and, and just a relief. It wasn't, it wasn't the great process that we had with the jump. Right. Where, um, you know, and even with Greg, when we were there, you know, because we're asking a lot of money to do these things. Right. And so you did get paid, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> No, we, we, we were asking money to do these things. So when we did the loop, Greg's like, hey, there can be, and he's a very experienced stunt guy. He's like, there can be a tendency to kind of, you know, downplay a little bit of what's going on here. Um, just because, you know, we're just sitting in the car and we're going to get used to it and it's not going to seem like a big deal. But just remember, it's a big deal. So it's okay to build up the danger every single time it's just fine you know because and he was right you don't want to come off the thing and be like oh that one seemed better yeah it was pretty good are you guys hungry you know you want to you want to like be like okay that was awesome great thank you guys so much oh yeah this was you know you want to be you want to make sure that everybody takes kiss the ground reason. every time <laughs> yeah. every time and it's not just to make a show of it it's not a full evil can evil thing it's just it keeps everybody on point it keeps everybody who touches the car, Billy Hammond, you know, he's yeah. building the cars. It keeps everybody serious okay. about it instead of getting complacent. And when you do those stunts, it's it's those kinds of balances with the human factor that you, you don't even think about how easy it is for us to get complacent in doing something stupid, complicated and scary. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was nice. That was nice to, to get that kind of perspective on it. I strangely, I ended up getting some credibility like in the stunt world and in the off-road racing world for that jump and for those loops. But um, even though they don't really translate much to stunts that you do in the movies, but I still get to do uh, a couple movies a year if I'm lucky. And I still love working stunts in movies because in those you are you're kind of telling a story and you get to crash on purpose, which is a unique thing um, in, in our line of work, but you kind of tell you're, you're acting with a car or driving, driving with a car in within a story is actually really fun. And I know you're a photographer. Um, I like photography. I don't have the skills that you do, but I like uh, imagining what things look like through the eye of, yeah. of, of a camera. And so I like driving to the lens for sure. Yeah, it's really cool. And quick, quickly rattle off like you've done a bunch of cool movies. What are what are sort of the highlights of the movies you've got to do some driving in? Um, I mean, my first one was Dukes of Hazard uh, with <laughs> Jessica Simpson. So I could we could just stop right there. I was a super fit, super fit Jessica Simpson at the rap party. She thought I was Topher Grace for just a fleeting moment. Went to give me a hug and got close enough to realize I wasn't Topher Grace, and then. I think I, I don't even know what happened after that. I just sort of blacked out. Um, the uh, Simpson going back into the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, do, some of the fun ones. I mean, there've been a lot of ones in the middle, in between. But some of the fun ones have been Dukes. That was a fun one. And then, and I did get to drive the General Lee for the first part of the movie. Reese Millen did most of the General Lee, and then I was the bad guy. Um, we were good guy, bad guy again in. Uh, Tokyo Drift, the third Fast and Furious movie. Um, in that one, I got the sweet gig, I think, as the bad guy, uh, again, because he had the sweet car. He could always drift, like, from the beginning. The good guy had to learn to drift along the way, and that was really hard for Reese to, um, you know, to fake it safely. And then, uh, but I saw, so I, I, that was a lot of drive. That was 60 nights, and we did a lot of cool setups for that. Um, some of the Bourne movies, some a little bit more in other Fast and Furious movies. Um, the uh, in the last couple of years, there's been, I don't know, there's probably been twenty different different movies, um, maybe a little bit more. But in the last couple of years, I did John Wick four, which was super fun. 
um, Ford versus Ferrari. And, uh, but John Wick, I actually trained Keanu to do the driving, so I didn't even get to drive. Okay. I, I did. I did some of the gags once on film. I spent four months there setting up shots, and I actually got to do kind of more coordinating than than driving, which was really fun and kind of a first for me oh, in, in cool. a yeah. big scale movie like that. Um, training Keanu was great. He was great to work with. He takes it, uh, all of his training very seriously and he was very good. Um, and then, and then he could do it all himself and he did it better than I could in that <clears throat> the storytelling side of it, like the way the director would describe it is we were like, okay, if Tanner comes through there and slides and then goes to this mark and then cuts through here and is out of the shot. It's like that looks like Tom Cruise, you know. That's that's like a Tom Cruise thing where you you, you hit the ground and then you get up running, you know. But John Wick is tired. He's tired, and you just look at Keanu. I mean, he's like did the Matrix and then went straight into the fourth John Wick where he's just fighting twelve hours overnight every night, twelve hours five nights a week. He's tired, so when he falls. He like is like gruff about it. He's like, oh, he takes a minute, gets himself up again, and then he starts running again. And that's how his driving was, too, his driving. He'd throw it in and then just kind of barely save it, almost miss this thing and hit that thing and then and then take off. And it was very, very John Wick. So it was it was interesting to see that in that yeah, instance, cool. it was back. The, is the, better the acting part of it. driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It it, that's t- that's tough for us. I remember even like doubling yeah. J- Jeremy James or Richard doing Grand Tour or Top Gear UK stuff, and it was yeah. the same thing where you had to not drive like you would do it, but drive like they would do it, which was you know it, it, it's challenging. You get you get used to trying trying doing everything as well as you can, and now you're being asked to do something poorly as well as you can, <laughs> kind of thing. I know. I was talking to somebody, I think it was somebody, Matt Johnson, who we both work with sometimes. Yeah. I was talking to him and he was doubling somebody in one of those. It was it was either for the UK Top Gear, could have been for another US show. It was probably for a US show. Yeah. And and I was like, just remember, I mean, you're doubling somebody who's not a driver. And if you <clears throat> You know, and in, in on the selfish side, if you make the world believe that this person can do all the stuff you can do, then what's the point of you? Yeah. You know, you, you're a driver. So if they're if they're there to present or act or whatever, that's their main thing. Um, and, you know, in, in a world, hopefully you can make something safe enough that they can be realistic about. Yeah. the driving yeah. and be passionate about it and laugh about it and they did that on top gear quite a lot yeah. um it, where they would spin out and they would show the interior shot of jeremy just hanging on for life yeah and, and they, they kept they kept it in reality in the u.s sometimes we just give up on the reality and, and you have a guy looking the wrong direction holding the steering wheel with his pinkies and his thumbs and then on the outside doing this monster hundred Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Formula yeah. D quality drift happening. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like, eh, yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, that's that's why Rich Rutherford. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's well, it. I was gonna say that's why Rich Rutherford established the slide snobs. Slide snobs. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. 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 He and I he and yeah, I kind of did that. You, you, you two did okay yeah, yeah it was before my time that it was established i remember that I was in vipers and uh, it, was, it was it was awesome though because it was like uh it basically judged movies driving on realism and you know how good the slide was and how good the driving was and stuff i love that i still do it to this day i mean obviously we all do but of course <laughs> you can't help yourself so, so all the stunt stuff, and that's pretty cool that you got to do some coordinator things as well, which is again sort of next level, and um, and it kind of makes sense. That's the direction that you'd go. Uh, all that kind of driving, and now of course, like your latest, your latest gig is is pretty wild as well, where where you're dri- a driver for McLaren, 
like, you know, let's be real here, like McLaren, as in McLaren, the Formula One team, the car manufacturer, um, the IndyCar team, all of that. And you're driving in this series called Extreme E, which is kind of this um, green motorsports electric car buggy in incredible locations um, and uh, racing against incredible drivers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, some of, you know, so just they sort of cherry pick the best of the best for that series. And you have a, a male driver and a female driver and, um, and you're racing head to head on these desert courses. What's that been like? Um, you know, I had an opportunity to, to drive it the first year with Andretti, a possibility to drive it the first year. And um, the conversation had happened, at least. And, and, I, and, and I really wasn't. I didn't understand the series. And then in talking to people at Volkswagen and stuff, is they they kind of pushed me away from doing it, saying they're really not, it's not really green. You know, it's still racing and they're calling themselves green and this and that. And the trucks definitely did not look sorted out. They're bouncing and flipping and rolling everywhere. And, and then when Zach called, it's kind of like, I mean, he had gotten my information from Michael because I raced for Michael on Andretti for a long time with the Volkswagen program. Um, I, I had learned a bit more at that point and got involved a lot of because of its McLaren and yeah. all the off tracks you get to do. I've gotten to drive Senna Formula One cars, a uh, couple different so ones, a couple of pro cars so in the mid 80s. <laughs> thousand horsepower thousand pound 1.5 liter formula one cars i mean just these ridiculous machines that mclaren just sort of has loaded up and they just fire out to these tracks to these heritage events and this year being the 60th anniversary of mclaren racing they're doing lots of them did goodwood this year and one and you know some really fun stuff but with extreme e the cars are getting more sorted now that they're on a fox suspension and um and with teams like mclaren involved that are helping to really get the chassis sorted out but now that i'm in it and in the second year of it it's really a great thing it really is and um you know i'm always going to have some sort of fire breathing something in the garage just like all of us are that's just who that's the generation we're from but um and it's not a series that claims to be saving the planet but what i get out of it that is a good move is it is a roadmap to motorsport on how it can become future proof mm -hmm. because whether you like it or not we're at an impasse with racing now as we know it um raising money the way that i did for racing uh through all the things we just talked about is going away when when you have a sponsor especially a manufacturer or a big sponsor a big company they have always content creation or motorsport. We have $5 million to spend on one of these two, which is it going to be? It's always going to be content creation because they can't lose. They can tell their story. More people will watch it. They can measure how many people watch it more accurately. So the money is, is going away from spending on motorsport. And they have this, they can always use this um, scapegoat of green factor or responsibility factor for not contributing more to you know carbon emissions and and stuff so what extreme e does is it races but then it also sheds light on some environmental issues and you know we'll go out there we'll plant grass we're not we're not there to make a difference in that way we're just there to talk about what the issue is there but the other fascinating thing that it does, well, first of all, by doing both of those things, the big sponsors come there. They spend sustainability money. They spend green money. Um, the other thing they do, which I really like, is they force the paddocks have to be a certain size. They're all inflatable. They all have to pack to a certain size and be able to transport in a certain size container. The um, number of people you can bring is limited. Everybody has to bring their own cutlery and plates there aren't any plastic or disposable cups or anything on site and so those kinds of little things not the big we're going to save greenland but those kinds of little things now are starting to go to other motorsports you're seeing formula e even formula one people carrying their own cutlery and and 
those are the things that are going to keep motorsport alive. And, uh, you know, we all benefit from the hundred years of motorsport that have happened. Seat belts, disc brakes, fuel injection, you name it, whatever we take for granted, that came from racing. That kind of innovation so far with electric cars has basically stopped. I mean, since, you know, the, the electric car five years had its range for certain weight battery, the innovation really hasn't gone anywhere from there. You know, automated driving and things like that will innovate, but the performance and reliability and even some of the safety isn't going to progress fast without racing. And so we need these things and these series like Extreme E to keep poking at the sustainability side in order to future-proof motorsport and keep big money spenders like manufacturers in the game. Because once they're completely out of the game, cars just don't get any better. They're just going to have more features, but they're not going to progress on a performance and reliability way that we you know, have seen over the last hundred years. There's my spiel. I was up on a soapbox there. I'll go ahead and get back down now. Oh, Pete. You know, yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you've changed. Where's that kid from, uh, you know, from the sushi restaurant in the first BMW events? <laughs> but that's kind of cool. I have no though. doubt. I have no doubt. I'll still jump a Crown Vic with you laying in the back. I have no doubt. I, with that. I have just, no, yeah. no I, doubt. No yeah. doubt. Well, I think this but is it, probably a pretty good place to to sort of call it good on learning about you and all the things you've done. I mean, you're the arc of your life and what you've achieved and accomplished. And again, with <laughs> as normal, like no real planning, um, just opportunities right. and, and uh, sensing opportunity and just trying, like you said, you know, throwing 10 things against the wall and uh, and and kind of you, you've eked out and grown this amazing uh, amazing career, quite frankly. And, uh, and again, I think a lot of it is down to your own curiosity, your own tenacity. Um, you know, you're a very smart guy. I hate admitting that, but it's true. Um, and you know, all the, all the things that kind of make you, you, and it's been, it's been really fun, um, to be a little part of that and be a friend of yours for, for quite a bit of it. And what I want to do now that we kind of understand what makes you tick, um, is I want to kind of shift gears a little bit for the for the next bit of this and uh, and talk a little bit more on the context of like optimum drive, which again you know you read and you wrote the forward to and all of that, and let's talk about I want to talk about your method, sort of the, the psychology of it, how you approach it, what you think is important, um, all of that. I think that's really interesting to people that are getting into motorsports getting into stunt driving, whatever the heck, getting into off-road driving, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I think you've got a, an amazing amount of knowledge in there. I know that from having conversations with you. So I think it'd be worth revisiting all of that and having a little bit of time to talk about that. So I want to thank you um, very much for, for going through all of this and, and sharing a lot with me. Uh, again, I've known you a long time and I learned a lot from, from this and Again, what makes you tick and what makes you the success that you are. And, um, and I think it's all well-earned and well-deserved. So thanks for watching. We're going to continue this conversation with another full episode with Tanner Faust. There was just so much to unpack about how he got where he was and what makes him the driver that he is. So make sure you come back and uh, get to see the finish of this story.